you're tuned in to the Believe in Arizona podcast. Hello, Bear Down Believers, and welcome into the show. I'm your host, Matt Reynoldson, and finally, it's another game week on the docket for the Arizona Wildcats. This is the Believe in Arizona podcast, and been a little inconsistent lately. If you don't know, I'm a producer also at ABC 15 here in Phoenix, Arizona, so kind of adjusting to the new schedule a little bit. We'll be more consistent coming up next week, especially as we enter crossover season with basketball as well. But for now, all eyes on football still. And the Big 12 debut of the Wildcats with a familiar foe coming over from the Pac-12. This is the Utah preview show. So Arizona-Utah coming up tomorrow night. ESPN primetime slot, or at least primetime out here on the West Coast. Might be a little Big 12 after dark for those people out East. But big one for the Arizona Wildcats and a chance to knock off the highest ranked team in the Big 12 Conference. Before we get to everything we got on this show, including my picks for the weekend from Arizona to the rest of the Big 12 to the rest of college football, I want to let you know that today's show brought to you by this bad boy. That's Melon Hats, my new favorite hat, honestly. Uh, really kind of gotten into this hat over the past week and been wearing it around kind of nonstop over the last five days. I feel like I'm carrying a little bit of a Kyle Shanahan vibe uh, this is the most comfortable hat you'll own. I mean, look at the structure, the shape, everything looks fantastic. I'm not much of like a hard bill guy. I bend mine just a little bit, but it came, you know, pretty crisp right there. But this is the hydro version of the melon hat. And it's something that is going to be really as versatile as you are, you know, be able to go out on the water. If you're going to the pool on a Friday afternoon or go on a hike, if you're, uh, if you're into that, getting up in the mountains, working out, you know, going on a run, uh, doing laundry at your house, everything. It's just everything you need this hat for. It's going to be perfect for, you know, the most premium, the most durable headwear. These are exactly what you want in an everyday hat. I mean, the shape, keeps its shape. You just got to try out one of these hats for yourself. So go to melon.com. That's M-E-L-I-N.com. Put it to the test yourself. It's the world's most durable hat at melon.com. I'll keep talking about it. I have a red hat that I'm probably going to wear for game night tomorrow night. That is if Arizona pulls off the wind, but I digress. Let's talk a little football, shall we? Especially because coming up on the show, I will make my picks on the college football weekend. But my overall assertion on this Big 12 conference and on the Arizona Wildcats is that this league is just weird enough for Arizona to come out and win it. And you couldn't have said that two weeks ago, coming off a 31-7 to loss at a K-State team in Manhattan, Kansas, against a team that simply just outclassed the Cats. Well, the last two weeks have been a bit of a reset for the Wildcats and being able to self-assess, being able to watch the film, being able to get a little bit healthier, you know, get guys like Dalton Johnson back, potentially a trading Stukes back, you know, work on that pesky eligibility case for Ja'Cory Krosky Merritt, which doesn't seem to be resolved as of yet. But just get yourself in a situation where you can have a two-week scout of Utah and a team, a Utah team that Arizona beat by a whole bunch last year by four scores and that was a pretty impressive win at Arizona Stadium last year in and of itself but this is the type of game where you can go into with a lot of confidence because the foe is familiar the venue is familiar even though it's not an easy venue to play in especially on a Saturday night Arizona had this bye week come at the perfect time to self-scout, to lick the wounds a little bit, to assess what went wrong in the non-conference because there was a lot that did not go right. But the bottom line is, this is what I said in the post-game show after Kansas State. Arizona was never going to make a college football playoff as an at-large team. Outside of going 12-1 and and losing into the Big 12 championship game, and even then I think it would have been a long shot because this college football playoff, I don't know if you know how college football works at all, but they're going to do their best to get four or five SEC teams and four or five Big 10 teams into this college football playoff. So that doesn't leave teams, that doesn't leave a lot of room for at-large teams from the ACC or the Big 12, especially if Notre Dame slides in there, because you do have to have a spot for the highest-ranked group of five champion. So... I don't think Arizona was ever in a position where they were ever going to make the college football playoff as an at-large team. So wash your hands of it. I know it was on national TV. I know it hurts a little more. I know the fashion in which it happened. 
was uncomfortable for U of A fans, but this is a clean slate. Arizona is 0-0 zero and zero in Big 12 play, and that's the most important thing. Arizona has a chance, just as good a chance as anybody else in this league to win the conference title, and a better chance than the teams that have started 0-1. ASU with a loss at Texas Tech, you know, some other teams that have dropped games early on in this Big 12 season. Frankly, they have a better shot right now, mathematically, than the K-State team that beat them two weeks ago. So that's important to figure out. Which brings me to my overall point. We saw in week four of the college football season that the Big 12 is just weird enough for a team like Arizona that found lightning in a bottle last year, that has a supreme amount of talent, that has a coaching staff that has been around the block and seen just about every ebb and flow of a season, as you can imagine. Over 80 years of experience, Uh, On this coaching staff, certainly over 70 years of experience between the offensive and defensive coordinators. That that alone is pretty impressive in and of itself. And you got Brent Brennan, who is in his eighth year as a head coach. So whatever you feel about this coaching staff, you can't say that they're inexperienced. You can't say that they haven't been around a disappointing loss before. And you can't say they haven't been around a bye week before. Maybe not this early in the season. It's pretty rare to have it in week four of the college football season, but it came at the perfect time for Arizona because it marked a juncture of this season. And they got to sit back and watch the chaos unfold. How about BYU racking up less than 250 yards of total offense and smacking a Kansas State team by 30 at home? That was as impressive a win as I've seen in college football this year. And it wasn't that BYU just dominated the game. BYU just made Avery Johnson really uncomfortable in his first road start as a power four quarterback. You know, this Avery Johnson, we saw what he can do on the ground and through the air against Arizona. But if you really truly watched that game and you watched K-State go up 14-7 into the halftime locker room and it should have been way more and Johnson make a big mistake at the end of the first half, you saw maybe someone that wasn't quite as ready for the Big 12 road environment as um, as he was for you know the comforts of home. He's a heck of a player playing in Manhattan. And spoiler alert, coming up later, I'm going to pick them to beat Oklahoma State at home this week because I think K-State's still a good team. I think K-State just ran into some, to a night where all went wrong in Provo, Utah. But, but could that have been what happened two weeks ago to Arizona in Manhattan? They played good ball for a half, but Noah Fafita throws, uh, fi- finds Malachi Riley late on a uh, on a post pattern into the end zone, sees him late, safety comes across, makes a great play. Would have been 14-14 at that point, whole new ball game, but instead that interception kind of took the wind out of the sails of Arizona. The coaching staff panicked a little bit, went away from the run game, and they've had two weeks to stew on it. So maybe two weeks ago in Manhattan was Arizona's version of K-State getting shellacked at BYU over the weekend. We'll see. We'll see. So that chaos. Then you have a couple other teams that are maybe not in the thick of the conference title race, but Colorado's comeback against Baylor was exactly what makes this conference so chaotic. Colorado dead in the water, hits a Hail Mary at the end of regulation, wins in overtime in miraculous fashion, and everybody says... Oh, Dion's boys are back. Shadur Sanders, Travis Hunter, they're back. No, it's just still it's still the same Colorado team. They still have no run game. They still have no identity as a team and as a program. Pump the brakes on Colorado. Baylor's not very good. Baylor got absolutely flummoxed against Utah a couple weeks ago in a non-conference game. Pump the brakes on Colorado. But that type of ending and that type of weirdness is exactly what we've come to expect from this conference. You know, a couple weeks ago, the TCU-UCF game, barn burner all the way to the finish. UCF now looks like a conference title contender, but they were this close to losing that game against the TCU team that gave up more than 60 points to SMU. To that SMU team that struggled to put away Nevada, a really terrible Mountain West team this year, struggled to put away Nevada in the first week of the season? In week zero, I guess I should say? I mean... Look, college football is a total week-by-week-by-week game, but if UCF's not that much better than TCU, and TCU is that far below SMU, there are still questions about UCF. 
Oklahoma State was supposed to be the second best team in this conference behind Utah. But we saw last week in that Oklahoma State and Utah game, and we'll get into that a little bit, but we saw last week in that Oklahoma State and Utah game an offense with no identity, an offense that had that brought back an All-American running back in Ollie Gordon, that brought back one of the best offensive lines in college football, probably the best offensive line in the Big 12, and they looked completely devoid of identity for 99% of that game. Utah was up 22 to three halfway through the fourth quarter final score 22 19 because Alan Bowman led a couple drives against the Utah prevent defense got a couple two point conversions on top of it and all of a sudden Oklahoma State's kicking it on side with 145 left chance to get the ball back go down and win the game but that game was not that close and I think part of it is because of Utah's defense I think Utah has a really good defense but I think a lot more of it was Oklahoma State just struggling for identity. And that's what gets me into this week. Gets me into Arizona going on the road to face this Utah team. If Utah had been lighting up the scoreboard on offense, if Utah had the you know the road riders up front, the dominant run game, Cam Rising, I'd be a lot more concerned about this game. And Utah is still a double-digit favorite, even though that line has slowly ticked back throughout the week in Arizona's favor. So even money or more money, I guess, coming in on Arizona's side of that double-digit line than on Utah's side of it. But one thing that really stuck out to me was the fact that this Utah team is led by a defense that is geared to shut you down. But if you show any semblance of balance, and if you show a way to out-athlete and out-execute Utah's defense, they're on their heels a little bit. Now, they haven't had a bad defensive performance this season yet. I think Utah has cemented itself with Iowa State as the best defense in the Big 12 Conference to this point of the season. But have they really been tested by an elite offense yet? You know, Oklahoma State really did look on their heels and identity list for most of that game. And Arizona, while Arizona also has some of those same problems, And we saw that come to a head against Kansas State. This coaching staff, this coaching staff that's been together now for just a few months, had a chance to sit back, to self-scout, to really take a critical self-look at why it went away from that first drive identity throughout the game against Kansas State. Look, Brent Brennan admitted almost as much that they kind of panicked. They panicked as a coaching staff. And I don't think that is an indictment on who they are as a coaching staff, who these guys are as individual coaches. I think it just comes down to these guys haven't coached a lot of games together. The 10 full-time assistant coaches, 11, 12, um, you know, however many Arizona has, uh, because they, they used to have the 10 full-time assistant coach limit by the NCAA. They knocked that out earlier this year, part of what allowed guys like Lyle Moivau to come in and coach quarterbacks for Arizona. But all of these guys have a voice in that room and should and how it's how it is in a lot of coaching staffs in america but if you don't know the true chain of communication if you don't know the true chain of how ideas are being brought about in game that just comes with reps and it's tough because you have two former head coaches in that room with brent brennan danny gonzalez the inside linebackers and special teams coach and dino babers the offensive coordinator, obviously former Syracuse head coach. He had a rough game last game. But the way Brennan explained it gave me a window, and maybe I'm just reading in between the lines here, but the way Brennan explained it gave me a window that these guys just maybe don't have the communication down yet. They don't have a bread and butter that they can go to when they trail in a game, and they don't have the chip away mentality, the comfort with trailing, that maybe some more veteran coaching staffs, I shouldn't say veteran coaching staffs, but coaching staffs that have been together for a lot longer time, maybe those coaching staffs have more of that comfort with trailing, have more of that comfort with their identity. We saw Arizona on their first drive last game go 15 plays down the field. Seven runs, eight passes, a touchdown run by Quali Conley. That was the most balanced the offense looked 
the entire game. Let's take a look at uh, the total yards, the total plays on Arizona's offense. Yeah, After that first drive, after Conley on that first drive carried the rock seven times, he only carried the ball seven times the rest of the entire game. And he had a great first drive, finished only with 48 yards. His long run of 14 was on that first drive of the game. That's 3.4 yards per carry for Pauly Conley. Noah Fafita credited with a couple rushes in and of himself. Those are never really designed. So anytime you see Noah Fafita in the rushing column, uh, just take those out. And then Kendrick Reesono late in the game, uh, two rushes for three yards, a 1.5 average. Arizona has to run the ball more than 16 times designed. And Arizona knows that. The coaching staff knows that. The coaching staff knows that they panicked and went away from the run game too early. And I think the biggest indictment on that was the fact that the staff didn't expect the defense to get a three and out on the first drive of the third quarter. That's what they did. The defense stopped K-State on the first drive of the third quarter. But they were still in catch-up mode. They were still in panic mode. And they didn't say, hey, let's just look at the scoreboard and realize we're down 14-7. We can churn this a little bit. We can give our defense a little bit of a rest. And then by the end of the game and by later in the game, K-State's offensive line just wore and wore and wore on that Arizona defensive front. Not the best game from Jacob Manu. The inside linebackers struggled a little bit. The defensive backs missed Dalton Johnson a lot because they couldn't contain Avery Johnson. And it just felt like things snowballed a little bit. It didn't feel like a 31 to 7 game until the fourth quarter when Arizona, frankly, gave up and then called a few ill advised timeouts. I digress. I've talked about that. I didn't like the timeouts there. Take the out, go home, get healthy. You got two weeks. But I don't think that was a 24 point gap between Kansas state and Arizona. I think just a lot of things snowballed in a road game in a tough road environment. You're underground. I've been at that stadium, Bill Snyder family stadium in Manhattan, Kansas. You're underground. It feels like the fans are on top of you. It feels like the pressure is mounting. And on a short week after that, a short week in a game that didn't come out very healthy from against NAU and they didn't feel very good emotionally, didn't look very good against NAU. That's really tough to uh, to come back and go on the road six days later and, and get a win, and especially with a coaching staff that has just been together for those few games. So I think the bye week, to speak overall, I think the bye week comes at a perfect time, and I think they get Utah at a perfect time for a gut check of what this team is. I think Arizona has the ability to create an identity. I saw it all fall camp. It was maybe a little hit or miss in the spring, but I saw it all fall camp, and that was Heavy sets, two tight ends, getting Kean Burnett and Roberto Miranda more involved in the passing game. You know, getting Tyler Powell more involved, because I think we've seen a lot of Sam Olson, but maybe a little bit too much of Sam Olson. But those two tight end sets, sometimes those two back sets with Caden Luke, the big freshman from Canyon Del Oro, leading the way in the run game, one of high one of PFF's highest graded run blockers on this Arizona team. I think that can be the identity and then realizing that you have a quarterback that you're not just going to drop back 50 times in the game. Let's take a look at his numbers. 42 passing attempts against Kansas State and had more dropbacks than that because he got sacked a few times. He had a few scramble rush attempts. So we'll call it 45 or 46 dropbacks. You cannot drop back Noah Fafita 45 or 46 times. They got away with that in the opener because New Mexico's defense is putrid and New Mexico has yet to win a game. So they got away from that in the opener, but I said it then, and I'm saying it now, I would have liked to see Arizona establish more of an identity in game one and game two going into game three. But if the only blemish or the only real black mark from those three games in which Arizona did not play up to the standard of football that we have become used to for the Wildcats over the last calendar year, the real thing with that is that Maybe they just needed to self-scout, get healthy, get a bye week, and get the balance back, take a deep breath, and know that the pressure of the win streak is over. Arizona had the nation's longest winning streak, longest active winning streak going into that game. They were looking to stretch it to double digits. They couldn't. That monkey's off their back. The win streak is over. You're going in as a double-digit dog. Nobody expects you to go into Utah to win, and you can play up that underdog mentality. 
And I think that's where guys cut from the Dick Tomey cloth. That's where Brent Brennan, that's where Dino Babers, that's where Dwayne Aquina. I think they all sort of thrive in that. And you can convince your team, you can give a locker room speech and convince your team that you're an underdog going into Kansas State, but I don't really believe it. Eh, we've won nine games. We've figured it out to this point. We've come back. We've gotten ahead. We've run away with games. We've fought out close games. Eh, we don't really believe we can lose. Well, now, 24-point loss in two weeks to think about it. You've been punched in the mouth. So, Arizona, how do you respond? I think, maybe this is just wishful thinking for me, but I think we're going to see a lot different Arizona team on Saturday night. We'll get to my picks here coming up in a couple minutes, but uh, you know, want to just f- put a final bow on the Arizona-Utah discussion because I will make my pick at the end of the show. I think it'll surprise you a little bit. Um, I'm bullish on what this team can be. And I'm bullish, the last thing I'll say in this opening segment, is that I'm bullish on the staff's willingness, at least based on what they said in press conferences this week, the staff's willingness to now play more guys, to get more guys involved, especially on offense, to get those tight ends more involved, to get more of a wide receiver rotation, to do something with Jeremiah Patterson that doesn't involve an ill an ill-designed screenplay to get Rayshon Speedy Luke more catches out of the backfield to get Caden Luke in those fullback sets a little bit more. And maybe we'll see Leif Magnuson at right guard this week, which I think would be important. And then you have Arizona's true starting five on the offensive line, because I don't think Ryan Stewart has been as good as Leif Magnuson would have been at that right guard spot. You know, we saw Leif come in, um, after the debacle of the first few minutes or the first quarter, first half in the Alamo Bowl last year, and it changed the look of the offensive line and it allowed Arizona to have that comeback. So I know Leif hasn't been healthy, but now when you got your offensive line healthy against the defensive line, you will probably need it the most against the rest of the season. I think that is super, super important for Arizona, and I think it'll allow them to establish things on the offensive side of the ball give Dwayne Aquina the ability to rotate more guys in on the defensive side, get more of those inside linebackers in, and get your back end healthy as well to really put some pressure on this Utah passing game. Coming up, I'll talk a little bit about this Utah team and how they won't have their starting quarterback most likely in Cam Rising. So we'll see Isaac Wilson under center for the Utes. All right, if you know anything about Utah head coach Kyle Whittingham, you knew he wasn't going to tip his hand on his quarterback situation this past week. But Isaac Wilson went on the road and got a true as a true freshman got a ranked win last week at Oklahoma State and was pretty impressive at spots in the process. They didn't finish drives very much. They kicked a bunch of field goals. I believe they kicked uh, off the top of my head. I believe they kicked three or four, maybe five field goals. So they didn't finish drives in the end zone, but had a nice play late to put him up 22 to three when he stepped up in the pocket and hit his tight end for kind of a walk-in touchdown on a post pattern over the middle, stepping past the edge rusher into a blitz and delivering a strike right there. His most impressive throw of the day by far, but Isaac Wilson. So let me put it this way. Arizona head coach Brent Brennan was asked yesterday about the main difference between Isaac Wilson and Cam Rising. (laughs) And he said, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but he said about a decade of college football experience. That's real. That's real. I mean, this is a guy coming into a hostile environment night game, his own hostile environment, so not truly hostile for him, but a a really pressure-packed environment night game at home against a team that's won a lot of games the past two years, against a team that beat this Utah team by four scores last year. So Isaac Wilson, a true freshman quarterback, is not the same option, not the same formidable force as Cam Rising. Rising is still dealing with that lacerated finger, and it seems like all all signs point to Wilson being the huge starter in this game. But I think that's a real advantage for Arizona, and I think it's a real advantage for a veteran defensive coordinator like Dwayne Aquina. I think... Akina can confuse Wilson with coverages. And while Wilson is a dual threat quarterback like Avery Johnson, I think Johnson sees the field a little bit better. Johnson sees his running lanes maybe a little bit better like we saw in the second half of that game. And I I think that Johnson's just a more formidable quarterback than Isaac Wilson is. I think Utah's a better team than Kansas State right now, at least K-State has been has done nothing to prove that at this point in the season that they are better than Utah. But I I think uh, I think Avery Johnson is right now a better quarterback than Isaac Wilson. 
Wilson will still present challenges to this Arizona defense, especially an Arizona defense that hasn't played up to par in any of the three games this season. Yes, that includes the NAU game because they were down most of that first half. And I know the only NAU touchdown was on a weird trick play, but NAU was allowed to control too much of that game. The Lumberjacks were simply allowed to control too much of that game. And so I think this Arizona defense has not played up to the par of what we saw last year when Johnny Nansen put together a top 30 defense. But what they'll see with this Utah team is a team that wants to establish the run, wants to control clock, but doesn't necessarily have the horses. Maybe they do up front. Maybe maybe you got the guys up front. I, I'm really high on this Utah offensive line. But I don't think they necessarily have the horses to really grind on Arizona, to really lean on Arizona like K-State did. So I think some throws, some plays will be on the back of this true freshman quarterback. And under the lights at home in a big-time game on ESPN, sometimes the pressure gets to you. Wilson is no stranger to pressure. His older brother, Zach Wilson, played for BYU, was drafted number two overall to the Jets, now kind of working his way through the Broncos organization, so he hasn't had maybe the best NFL career. But he comes from a football family, knows the football DNA, and has seen his brother be in a lot of pressure-packed situations, has seen some pressure-packed situations himself, looked cool, calm, and collected against Oklahoma State. But they were also going up against an Oklahoma State team that never found an offensive identity in that game. What if Arizona goes blow for blow with Utah? Will Wilson start to press it down the field a little bit? Could we see some U of A defenders finally get those interceptions? Could we see Takario Davis finally snag one pull one in i mean bobo's been bobo's been overdue for you know a, a couple picks in a game for what seems like months what seems like a year and a half we saw him we saw a bunch cradled in his hands last year because he was always in the right spot at the right time but could never bring down the ball could this be the big game for bobo could this be the big game for gunner maldonado could Dalton Johnson come back? He talked to the media this week, so I think that's a good sign that he's playing. Could Dalton Johnson come back and have a big game? Could Genesis Smith be that ball hawk type player we saw when he came down for that epic interception against Oklahoma last year in the Alamo Bowl? I think things set up a little bit better for this Utah game for Arizona. I think the two-week prep is really important for this Arizona team. Utah's played four, four straight weeks to open the season. You know, this is a, you know, this is a team that's played quite a bit of football. This is a team that knows how to recover because they have a veteran head coach and a darn good one at that. And this is a team that'll be out for blood because it thinks that Arizona may have disrespected it last year. And I want to touch on that real quick before we get into my picks of the college football season. So I've seen a lot of chatter this week from Utah fans that this game is personal. They're out for blood because they think Arizona disrespected them last year when Jaden Delora threw a big-time bomb at the end of the game to Tedero and McMillan to put the cherry on top of that 42-18 to home win over the Utes. Now, let me put some context in that. Arizona had the ball up 35-10, to four minutes left in the fourth quarter. They were clearly not running ambitious plays. Jed Fish was clearly calling plays to run out the clock, bleed things out, get out of their healthy 25-point win, show respect to Utah, show respect to the game, and just put it to bed because that game was over in the first half, really in the first quarter if you watched it closely. Arizona running the ball. Utah sells out to stop them, sells out to stop them, sells out to stop them. Whittingham calls all three timeouts with under four minutes to go in a 25-point game. That's four scores for those of you that don't math. Calls all three timeouts, forces Arizona to punt, gets the ball back, blitzes it down the field, running two minutes the whole time, scores, touchdown. They go for two, which when you're down 25, let's do the math for that. Going for two, you're down 19 Going for two, you get it. You're down 17. That's still four scores. Still three scores, sorry. That's still three scores. 19 to 17 does you no difference on the scoreboard if you're trying to make a comeback. So the going for two was useless. Then Utah has the audacity with 
under two minutes to go, no timeouts, in a three-possession game to kick an onside and waste all of our time with that. Arizona recovers the onside kick. Jaden Delora gets in the game. After coming back from injury, after having just a really topsy-turvy year, losing his starting job even after he came back from injury to Noah Fafita, um, you know, a guy that Jed Fish had clearly put his arms around a lot. So Fish, obviously irked by Whittingham's antics, which Whittingham has been known to do, dials one up for JDL and gets his senior quarterback that moment of the season, that bomb. Now, in a normal situation, I don't agree with that at all. I don't care who you're throwing out there. I don't care if it's your backup quarterback. I don't care what the story is. In a normal situation, you don't do that. But I remember standing on the field and filming that game as a TV reporter for KVOA in Tucson and being like, what in the world is Whittingham doing? Why is he wasting all of our time here by burning through these timeouts and blitzing it down the field and kicking on sides, going for two? That's stupid. Why risk the health of your guys for nothing? Dude, the game's not over. The game is over. It's a four-score game. It's a 25-point game with under four minutes to play in the fourth quarter. Get out of here with that. Get out of here with the two-point conversion. Get out of here with the onside kick. Everything Fish called right there, that JDL bomb, was fully warranted, and Utah has no right to claim disrespect from it. But that's been the chatter all week. So apparently... If it's up to the fans, Utah will be taking this game personally. I don't know if emotion plays into this game at all. I think Utah right now is the better team, but I think the matchups do favor Arizona, and we'll go into that when we go into my picks here in a few minutes. All right, it's time now to make my picks for the week here on the Believe in Arizona podcast, and we'll start, as we always do, with the Big 12. The Saturday headliner to start off the day, your noon game. Eastern time, your 9 a.m. time, 9 a.m. game, Arizona time. It's Kansas State against Oklahoma State at home. KSU currently a five and a half point favorite by ESPN bet. The total 57 and a half points. I like the under on this one a lot. I think that Oklahoma State offense did not show anything against uh, uh, against Utah last week to show that they're going to be able to move the ball, especially against a defense like Kansas State. Don't get it twisted with this Kansas state defense. This is a real defense. They didn't give up. They gave up under 250 yards to that BYU team, but special teams was a huge difference in that game. And Avery Johnson's turnovers were as well. I like Kansas state to cover that five and a half points rather comfortably. I think a 10 to 13 point win could be in star for the wildcats at home. And I like that under 57 and a half. I think that's a pretty solid bet there in Manhattan for an early game in the little apple. BYU at Baylor. Is BYU for real? Let's see. I mean, they showed the ability to run the ball. They showed the ability to stop the run. They showed the ability to capture a lot of that momentum at home against Kansas State. I mean, that was your classic thumping from an unranked team against a team on the verge of the top 10. And just shows you what kind of chaos we'll see in the Big 12 this season. Baylor is somewhat shockingly a three-point favorite at home. I I don't know. Maybe I'm underrating Colorado. Maybe I'm underrating Colorado. But they blew the game against a really average Colorado team in spectacular fashion. And you're telling me they're a three-point favorite at home against a BYU team that has started 4-0? And maybe BYU gets a little too big for their britches after that big home win against Kansas State. But... You know, give me BYU right now. I have no reason not to pick BYU right now. They've proven more to me this year. They're plus 135 on the money line. I think that's a strong bet. I think Baylor is really in an identity crisis right now, despite having really strong offensive play and some really strong offensive weapons. I think Dave Aranda is securely on the hot seat. And I think that loss to Colorado is a tough loss by them. It's a bad loss by them. And they didn't really show any ability to give Utah a fight in the road game a couple weeks ago. I don't see it with Baylor right now. Is there any reason I should? 
I certainly don't see them getting a home win over BYU, but maybe this com- maybe this conference will continue to provide the delicious chaos of the Big 12 of old and will enter this new era of Big 12 football with the same fun flavor of wild Saturday to Saturday results that we became so accustomed to over the past two decades in the Big 12 conference. Give me BYU on the road plus 135 on the money line. TCU at Kansas, this is a battle of two teams that just so desperately need a win right now. TCU coming off that horrid defensive performance against uh, against SMU in a non-conference game in the battle for Dallas-Fort Worth, and boy, did they look bad in that game. Kansas is a one-and-a-half-point favorite in this game. They have dropped games to West Virginia now last week by a very close shave in Morgantown. That's a tough place to win, so credit to K-State for making that almost a game. And then dropping a game at home earlier on in the season against an Illinois team that we now know is very good. Um, it was That was actually on the road in Champaign, and they you know played Illinois fairly well. But now, after what Illinois did to Nebraska last week, this Illinois team looks for real, especially in the trenches. They know how to disguise their defenses. Aaron Brooks, their defensive coordinator, a young star in this industry. Luke Altmaier playing as well as any quarterback in the nation right now. And they can ground and pound you a little bit. And their defense does a lot of things that now makes sense why they flummoxed Kansas's offense. So that's not a bad loss by Kansas, although at the time it tumbled them out of the rankings. And then the home loss to UNLV. I know KU made a a bunch of mistakes in it, but this UNLV team could be the best team in the group of five. So KU's one in three record, I think, is a little deceiving. I think Lance Leipold is a very good coach. I think they have an identity crisis on offense that they have to figure out and get Jalen Daniels back on track and playing a little bit better. But TCU, I mean, that was an eyesore last week. That was a game that really sounded the alarm bells for me for TCU. So I think Kansas comes back home and gets a big win at home, a really important win for the rest of their season. Give me a rock chalk minus one and a half in that game. Colorado at UCF. Colorado winning on a miracle against BYU last week. UCF still undefeated at 3-0, a 14-point favorite at home. Here's the stat to know about UCF, the number one rushing offense in the Big 12 and the number one rushing defense in the Big 12. In week two, Nebraska ran all over Colorado, just pounding their way through that CU defense. Second half, things slowed down a little bit, but a lot of touchdowns got called back by questionable penalties on the outside. That should have been a 42 to 10 game, and mostly because Nebraska established the run game in that one. I think CU's defense has gotten better, but this is a team that also just gave up 35 points to Baylor. So if you're going, if you're just taking the number one rushing offense and the number one rushing defense in the conference, and you're going against a Colorado team that is fully two dimensional with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter, give me the team that runs the ball and stops the run, especially at home. I like UCF in this game. I don't know if they'll cover 14. Um, that 61 and a half total uh, looks. I mean, I know I've been prone to unders on this show if you've been following, but that 61 and a half total looks somewhat tasty for the over. So the afternoon game on Fox, the 1230 Arizona time game on Fox, give me UCF to win. I don't know if I'd take the cover on that, maybe, but I kind of like that 61 and a half over under in that game. Iowa State at Houston, not much to talk about in this one. Houston's a mess. Iowa State is a 16 point favorite. They look like the class of the Big 12 right now, along with Utah. Um, Iowa State, I expect to roll in this one. It's only a 43 and a half point over under. I would take the over in that. I think Houston, uh, I think Houston can maybe get some points on the board, even though this Iowa State defense is really good. Uh, they are at home, uh, but this is not even a trap game for Iowa State. Iowa State rolls easy. I like the 16. Um, it's a pretty good line, honestly, but give me a 20 point win by Iowa State in Houston as the wheels continue to fall off in Willie Fritz's first year down there. Cincinnati, Texas Tech is pretty interesting. Uh, Cincinnati coming off that home win over Houston. Still don't really know how to peg this Cincinnati team. It's a nice win for uh, that's a nice win for Texas Tech over. Arizona State last week. The Sun Devils now on bye this week. So it was a nice home win for Texas Tech last week. I think they've got some real pieces. I think, uh, you know, that was a game where ASU came in with a lot of confidence. Texas Tech did a nice job controlling the game, coming out with the plays when they needed to come out with the plays. I just think Cincinnati is such an unknown, and I can't pick them to go into Texas Tech and get a win. Give me Texas Tech minus three, the three points in this game, and the Red Raiders come into Tucson next week for Arizona's Big 12 home opener with a 4-1 and one record. 
Arizona, Utah, we'll get to after the marquee matchups of the week. But I want to get to this one because it is the tantalizing one on the slate this week. And it's the game we've been waiting years for, a home and home, because it feels like between the SEC East and the SEC West, they've never gotten a chance to really play in the regular season. And that is Alabama, Georgia. Alabama, a home underdog by two and a half points for the first time since 2007. 2007. There are kids almost in college that weren't born the last time Alabama was a home, home underdog. Just two losses in something like their last 60 home games. One to Texas and one to Joe Burrow's LSU team. Alabama is a wagon. But this game, I feel like it's such a toss-up. I feel like it's going to be so fun to watch, and it's such a toss-up. But the one thing that I keep coming back to on this game is that I truly think that in the matchup between Georgia's defense and Alabama's offense, I think Georgia's defense is better. And in the matchup between Alabama's defense and Georgia's offense, I think Georgia's offense is better. This is going to be a heck of a game. Incredible atmosphere in Tuscaloosa on a Saturday night. But I just think in the margins, in those little tiny margins, I think Georgia's better. I think Georgia's better. And I don't think Jalen Milrow has enough to, while I think he is maybe the better quarterback than Carson Beck in this matchup, I think he's certainly more dynamic. I don't think he has enough to overcome those margins. I think it's going to be an absolute classic game. I think there's a, the total is going to be you know right near that you know, 45 number. I think this is going to be you know an epic battle, another epic battle like we've seen in so many SEC championship games between Georgia and Alabama. ESPN bet has Georgia as a one point favorite. Um, I, I like Georgia in that matchup. I like Georgia to win uh, and obviously cover the one on the road. Uh, I do like that under 50 and a half. I think that's really intriguing, uh, especially because these defenses are both really interesting and I'm not fully sold on Georgia's offense yet, but that, you know, those little margins are just going to be super fun to watch in this game. Another ranked matchup. We'll scroll on up here. We'll go to the afternoon matchup in the ACC Notre Dame at home against Louisville. And the more I watch Notre Dame back to back wins against, uh, against teams that they clearly overmatched, including one, two weeks ago against Purdue in West Lafayette, when they beat the Boilermakers 66 to seven, I think this Notre Dame team is a lot better than what they showed against Northern Illinois. I think it was just a fluke. I mean, I, I hate to say it because you can't really consider anything in college football to be a fluke. I think that is as close as it comes to being a fluke. Not sold on Louisville. I think Jeff Brom is a great coach. I think they have good quarterback play in Tyler Shop. And I think, um, you know, this is a team that is going to make some noise in the ACC. But I think at Notre Dame, I think this is a – Notre Dame knows this is a must win. Notre Dame knows this is a game they have to run away and hide. And I think the team, the offense, has started to click the last couple games. Give me Notre Dame to easily cover that seven points. Actually, like a blowout win by Notre Dame at home over this Louisville team, no matter how well coached they are. Scroll up, make sure I didn't miss anything. Miami all over Virginia Tech. That doesn't really deserve uh, too much. I guess that's I guess that's today. So we'll give that a watch tonight, but not worth a pick, certainly. Um I think we have hit most everything. Texas, a 37 and a half point favorite against Mississippi State, uh, especially after the way Mississippi State looked against ASU. That might be a, a rather light line right there. Uh, I don't see Ohio State having any trouble with Michigan State on the road. I think that Michigan State team is still just kind of figuring it out. Stanford at Clemson is somewhat interesting, especially because Stanford went on the road and beat a good Syracuse team last Friday night. Uh, you don't see a lot of Friday night road wins. We saw two last Friday night on uh, on that September 20th. So, you know, this is this could be a game. Stanford could go out to Clemson and give them a game, but Clemson looked really good against NC State, an NC State team without their quarterback last week. The offense was humming. Kate Klubnick looked really good. Blowout win at home for Clemson. I think that 21 and a half is somewhat heavy, especially considering that Stanford's looked okay so far. But uh, you know, give me give me Clemson to roll pretty easily in that game. And the last ranked on ranked matchup. I guess I got two more to get to because I'm gonna I'm gonna pick the Boise State Washington State game as well. But I want to get to this Illinois Penn State game first because this is the most inflated line of the week. I have ESPN bet has Penn State as a 19 and a half point favorite against number 19 Illinois. This is an Illinois team that's pretty good in the trenches. And 
yeah, I know Drew Aller, the Penn State quarterback, has looked a little bit better this year, but has he looked that much better to where you're expecting Penn State to blow out a ranked team at home by 20 points, by three scores? This feels like an Illinois cover all day long. And uh, Illinois is plus 600 on the money line. James Franklin, the Penn State head coach, calling for a whiteout type atmosphere. Penn State saving their whiteout game for later in the season against Washington. But, you know, I think this Illinois team could go and, you know, give Penn State a real game and a night game under the lights in Happy Valley. Uh, I think Luke Altmyer is playing as well as any quarterback in the nation. I think that defense disguises coverage as well. And I think Drew Aller has not proven to America that he's good enough at reading complicated coverages disguised coverages to tear up this illinois defense to tear up this illinois secondary give me illinois covering all day long i think they could actually go into happy valley and win i'm not picking them to do that give me penn state by about seven maybe ten but no way penn state covers that three score favorite line washington state at boise state may be one of the most interesting games of the week because boise has one of the Heisman front runners and one of the best players in the nation in Ashton Janty. They're starting running back. He had six touchdowns in week one and a win over Georgia Southern. You know, they were super impressive in pushing Oregon to the absolute brink in week two, especially after Oregon didn't look so hot in week one. I think Boise could be in line to get that, you know, get that coveted spot as the highest ranked group of five team and sneak their way into the college football playoff, especially if Janty continues to run like he has. Washington State still not ranked, but four and oh, he coming off a nice Apple Cup win against Washington a couple weeks ago. So you know, this this will be a really interesting matchup, but, you know, give me Boise on the blue turf because I think that'll be a really interesting game. Which brings us to uh, stretch out a little bit, stretch out with my melon hat right here, M-E-L-I-N dot com. If you want to get, get yourself one of these bad boys, Arizona and Utah. I think Arizona, this is the spot where we find out what this team is made of what the identity is of this team and of this program and what this coaching staff is made of. I don't think I'm going to call it right now. I don't think there's any shot Utah covers in this game. I don't right now. Well, ESPN has it as an eight and a half point favorite Utah. Um, it's, it was 12 earlier this week. So I don't think there's any chance it's a double digit result in favor of Utah. I just don't. Unless the wheels really come off for Arizona, in which we'll have more concerning things to talk about in the end analysis, I don't think that Arizona is going to get handled in this game. I actually think everything breaks somewhat well for the U of A. I really do. I think Noah Fafita taking a couple weeks rest to get his body right and you know not take those massive hits that he did against Kansas State. Tedero and McMillan, I mean, as electric as he was in week one we have to consider that t-mac was still coming off off-season surgery so maybe the three-game workload was a lot for him in the first three weeks so he's healthy arizona has the best player on the field they do and utah's not going to cover him not going to be able to cover him tedero mcmillan is the best wide receiver in college football maybe the best player in college football him and travis hunter right up there together T-Mac is an absolute mismatch against Utah. And if Arizona actually gets the tight ends involved, actually gets those number two and number three wide receivers open and reps and catches, looking at you, Montana Lamonius Craig and Devin Hyatt and Jeremiah Patterson and Rex Haynes in this stable of wide receivers that we saw during fall camp that have yet to break out, that'll open things up for T-Mac. And it'll open things up for the run game. I want to see a commitment for the run game for Dino Babers. I want to see more Kendrick Reesano in the backfield. I want to see more Rayshon Speedy Luke out of the backfield. I think things line up very well for Arizona because Arizona can spread out this Utah defense, which against a really hard-nosed defense is the only way you're going to beat them. It's the only way you're going to beat them. So I think Arizona has the athletes to do that. I think Arizona has the athletes to spread them out. I think this We'll see what the offensive line combination is, but I think this group has the ability to at least keep Utah's front seven at bay. I think Arizona will be able to run the ball enough, at least commit to some sort of balance. You know, get me 125 rushing yards on the ground for the game for Arizona. That's all I'm asking for. 125 is not a lot, but get me 125 on the ground for Arizona, and I think U of A has a really good shot to win this game. 
and then give a give me a really complicated defensive scheme for Dwayne Aquino to confuse the true freshman quarterback and Isaac Wilson to force him into a couple untimely interceptions. Here's my out on a limb pick. Arizona goes into Utah and gets the win. 26 to 24. Four Tyler Loop field goals. Utah bows up in the red zone a lot. Utah bows up on their half of the field, but Tyler Loop is the best kicker in the nation. He is going to have a day in Salt Lake City in that high elevation air. He's going to put a boot into a few, maybe have his career long. I think this sets up as a game for Tyler Loop to go out and win it, maybe on a last second field goal. But I have Arizona 26. Utah 24, Arizona gets a huge win against the highest ranked team in the Big 12. The number 10 ranked Utah Utes go down at home in their first loss of the season. All is forgiven from two weeks ago from Arizona's blowout loss at Kansas State. And the Wildcats put themselves at 1-0 and in the Big 12 and right in the thick of that conference title race heading into October. All right, that'll do it for me here on the Believe in Arizona podcast. Reminder to please subscribe to my YouTube page at Matt underscore Reynoldson. And please go ahead and like and listen to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. That's B-L-E-A-V in Arizona. We'll have a post-game show after the Utah game. It'll either be up Saturday night or Sunday. But until then, have a great weekend and bear down.